Outstanding, Scotty. Good morning. Good Are we morning. bright and shiny? It is, it is It is good to see. You're just looking healthier and healthier every time I see you with that, that uh, glorious sunshine from Queensland giving you a glow. Well, see, I'm in... Indoors, it. but I'm, just, I'm talking more about your just general level of energy. Thank you. I, I'm in my new office. I actually now have sunshine through the day, so I can track daylight. I, I'm quite excited about this. I've, I have been sort of watching with a fair bit of jealousy um, the, the renovations and the changes that you're doing to your uh, your clinic. All that extra bloody room that you've got while us uh, Sydney people are stuck in <laughs> tiny little clinics because the rent's too <laughs> bloody high. Although you're paying a lot more rent than I am, so there's, there's that. That, that yeah. does make me feel a little bit better. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't make me feel all that good. I've just got to make it pay. Uh, I've got more new toys to try and help with that. Ah, uh, fancy such as? Uh, I just got the the new B-Trax uh, force balance plate has just arrived. Ah, interesting. Yep. And uh, we're going to be looking after having done, uh, here's your plug, uh, Brett, FNOR 6, absolutely magnificent course on uh, whiplash concussion migraine. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got some of the new toys uh, coming specifically to look at doing a whole lot more concussion rehab, uh, dysautonomia, uh, and making use of my extra space that I have here. And the B-Trax, uh, is that something that was promoted by the FNORs? Because I know they've got their... Um a few different um, yeah, what's the name of their big fancy suite uh, the new new axon uh, yeah so B Trax is uh, not necessarily specifically promoted by Fnor but uh, some of the people who are involved uh, with it uh, have suggested this is quite a a good um, uh, plate to be using it mm -hmm. uh, appears to be accurate it appears to be useful it's capable of being transported to the sideline of a football game and so you can oh, do that. concussion assessment on the fly at the game mm -hmm. someone has a head knock we've got their baseline we can have a look at them straight away whereas mm -hmm. some of the other ones like the the caps machine uh is kind of thought to be certainly by some of the big people in our field the uh the granddaddy of all things and mm. it's certainly the most expensive but it's also fundamentally the least portable uh mm. and it's hypersensitive to instability uh mm. which will throw every one of your measurements off and so it's not Does, really doesn't lend itself to sport uh, field to, no assessment. and that's that's really where I'm wanting to get into is a lot more of the the helping because mm. uh, there's no one doing concussion particularly well here in Brisbane uh, for an on the fly mm. assessment with football players. It's can you uh, can you fill out this form and and the problem basically is, is that you can game those scat five forms. You can play it dumb at the beginning of the season and therefore uh, once you've had a head knock you're actually running kind of at the same sort of level so to speak. Or you can try and remember them and actually learn the sorts of questions that they're going to be asking mm. and so you're not actually giving any true representation because if you're being paid to play footy you need to be on the field yeah memorize that uh those mm. questions for the so, uh players at home um can you run through force plate and why measuring center of mass and gravity and, and your sway parameters is an effective um concussion test uh, well, not as well as some people can, I can guarantee you that. Make, make it up, just say. So make it up, yeah, yeah. okay. So <laughs> the human being, uh, from my point of view, spends at least 60% of its energy on the brain, and of that, the majority is actually spent feeding uh, commands through your axial structure, your spinal structure, legs, etc., to hold you upright, looking into the distance with your ears at... Um, you know, 180 degrees from one another on the sides of your head so that you've got the widest peripheral vision, the widest soundscape, and that you're looking forward up and into the distance. So if you've had a head knock, your ability to actually do that becomes very muted. And so for some people it'll be really bad, for some people it won't be as obvious. The force plate will actually measure really, really tiny fluctuations in those movements. So when you're 
uh, you're standing upright, everybody sways. Now there's a normal sort of sway pattern that's kind of a, a figure of eight generally or kind of a circle in one direction, circle in the other direction as the, the planet spins that we're all meant to do. So when there's distress to, to the vestibular system of the inner ear or the cerebellum or some of your balancing mechanisms, we can get uh, an aberrant, a, a misfiring of those uh, neuromuscular patterns and people can be kind of leaning funnily off to one side or trying to fall backwards and forwards and they they become very fixated in an aberrant movement pattern. So the idea is that if we take a baseline reading of these football players at the beginning of the season and we know what their, their standard kind of sway is and we can measure that, when we put them back on the plate and we're seeing an uh, a, a change, you know, instead of doing this figure of eight, they're suddenly kind of wonking off to the left hand side, constant mm. sway, constant sway. Uh, you can actually determine whether it's an injury in the structure an injury to the vestibular system and we can make determinations as to whether the person can actually perform within the certain parameters that the consensus statement has determined is appropriate and you can make a call as to whether this person's just got a, a physical injury or a neurological injury at that particular moment in time. So Mitch, that was that that was beautiful. What are you talking <laughs> about? You're going to make it up. That was super succinct. Well done. Thank you. Well done. I think because uh, yeah, the the vestibular and brainstem cerebellar structures um, are your go-to measurements for concussion, just because of the, the force that you put through your noggin makes that brainstem particularly susceptible to torsional style injuries, which is why you get that balance. Because um, although I think. The, the, from my experience, the uh, general pop is sort of very aware of what happens to the thinking brain side of the equation from a concussion. You think you've got that, and there's that nice video of your brain looking like jelly and you sway mm. back and forth and it flips yep. all over the place and people go, oh, yeah, that's bad. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, most of the aberrant symptoms like uh, yeah, that brain fog and, and balance and disequilibrium does come from lower structures being yep. brainstem. And what's is, really cool that I learned, you know, it, it's going to sound really obvious to you. And, and it was one of those, oh, of course, sort of moments. But the instructors are standing there and, and they're starting to talk about whiplash. And the, the new consensus statement is all whiplashes cause concussion. Mm. And, you know, I... I old enough now and I've been doing this long enough I started training in 93 and whiplash was taught as a new uh, like a musculoskeletal injury you've yanked on the ligaments in the neck the muscles are sore mm. the the tissue sore and a concussion was a neurological disorder the brain had been shaken mm. about but of course no one's bothered to to make it clear because you know sadly as most of us will do we get taught something so that's how we operate so i was taught that that's separate from that and not well you know mm. the brain is connected to the dura the meninges which is connected directly to the skull and the uh the upper vertebra and so if mm. you shake the neck and the the skull with force such as in a motor vehicle accident or football or otherwise and whiplash yourself you're going to yank on the brain Mm, you get, you, impossible to to uh, do one to not do it. As I mm. say, I'm like sitting at that moment, go, oh, of course, mm. how stupid ever, and it, it just seems really clear. But I, my figuring is most of the people out there haven't connected the dots. You know, the the average. Uh, population person who's sitting in their car and gets run up behind while they're sitting on, you know, Coronation Drive here in Brisbane or the Sydney Harbour Bridge or, or something like that, and they get a mild kind of whiplash and they go, oh, yeah, my neck's just a bit sore. They're not taking on board the fact that that's actually a neurological compromise mm. and it could lead on to other problems. And so that's the other cool thing that came out of it was the actual consensus statement on concussion gave us a bit more insight to what we're actually looking at, which is if the concussion itself, the whiplash leading concussion or the, the torsional head twist that creates stress on the neurological structures in an adult will last two weeks. Any symptoms occurring mm. after that are now what are called uh, post-concussive disorder or post-concussive syndrome. Mm. And like 
it's not concussion at that stage. A concussion is a discrete thing. It's the initial injury. It lasts two weeks in an adult, four weeks in a child. And mm. anything going on after that is actually a, a, a separate and distinct thing. And it can be aggravated by underlying conditions such as migraine or depression or, mm. you know, POTS. Um, and we've really got to be very clear about that, as well as looking at what generally we're hunting for is, as you mentioned before, dysautonomia and negative impact on the brainstem and the areas that affect the gut, the mm. heart rate, the respiratory rhythm, as well as the inputs towards people's personality. And we're not really giving enough uh, attention to the fact that people will experience significant personality disorder, change in mood, change in behavior, mm. uh, post having a decent whiplash or head knock. Well, I think that's also, I mean, the people are becoming more and more aware of um, sort of gut being a, uh, like a neurological component to gut, mm. and, you know, the vagus nerve and the brain gut connection. Um, but, you know, if you get whiplash and you get that post-concussion syndrome, you don't necessarily have to have your classical hallmarks of a concussion being, you know, brain fog and headache and blah, blah, blah. No. And you're like, you could get, oh, you know, I've got whiplash and now my guts are upset. That's okay. it. Con concussion. But um, uh, this, uh, you know, whiplash and talking about concussion, that's a neat little segue into the other thing that I wanted to talk about being, uh, well, you mentioned the term the other day and I didn't know what you were talking about. Uh, you said mitochondrial leakage and I thought maybe hmm. you needed a, a tissue or something and you had some sort of problem going on but um, no uh, but uh, well, yeah so but the other thought that I had on that is that you get some people where they have a little bit of whiplash and they they you know just the neck pain and then a tiny bit of whiplash and neck pain tiny whiplash neck pain and then the fourth bit of whiplash and then they're finally getting that post concussion syndrome and it's analogous to you know a boxer's only got so many times he can get hit in the face before he's He's getting concussion syndrome and, and a glass jaw. Um, so I think that's exactly it. Part of the issue with that, people connecting the neurological component of whiplash to concussion, is that, it, I mean, compared to getting punched in the face, um, <laughs> mild whiplash yeah, from a force point of view isn't quite as, as great. So it is taking more whiplashes to get to that concussion state in some people. But mm. yeah, if you're getting three whiplashes and no problems, then people are, are sort of, you, you've got that tolerance to force until you don't, and then you really don't. <laughs> yes, that's, yeah. that's absolutely the case. And again, a lot of the, the brain fog is considered to be due to stuff like mitochondrial leakage. Now, mm. mitochondrial leakage, you know, it's... <laughs> but, bless you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> the inappropriate parts of my brain kind of is just misconstruing it as something else, it, I can tell it's you. It's Friday morning, buddy. Yeah. Can, uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, but the mitochondria are the energy factories in every one of the cells. And so some cells might have, you know, a few, seven, a hundred, etc. But neurological cells have, you know, hundreds to thousands of mitochondria, and they're the factory that actually makes energy. Now, as part of that energy uh, production, they actually shunt protons and electrons around. And uh, basically, the movement of those things uh, is is what drives pumps in our body to produce ATP, which is the actual currency that all of our muscle cells, etc., use to actually do any work. So uh, one of the, the beliefs is actually that the true definition of death is when the last uh, enzyme in your last mitochondria actually stops producing ATP. Mm. It's kind of an interesting, creepy thought. But... <laughs> <laughs> One of the, the interesting things behind this is, of course, that every mitochondria requires four iron molecules. And you'll keep hearing me harp on all the time about iron <laughs> deficiency and how our diet and whether is we're getting enough iron yeah, um, is actually getting into us. And one of the most basic reasons is that the protein structures in every one of the mitochondria require iron to actually make the enzyme work. So you cannot create a concentration gradient of protons and electrons to actually make your mitochondria work without the iron molecule being there. Mm. So, you know, people on low iron diets are really susceptible to, to greater amounts of uh, neurological um, fragility, if I could use such a word. Mm. Um, 
post having head knock concussion whiplash. Mm. Now, the other sides of this is that the the great theory of aging is um, currently being postulated by some in the field to be due to this thing called mitochondrial leakage. And basically, as you're trying to make energy and you don't have the uh, the buffers, the superoxide dismutase enzymes or catalase or otherwise to soak up the free radicals that are being produced, you actually punch holes in your mitochondrial membrane causing them to die. Now, when enough, huh. of, when enough of your mitochondria basically rupture, it mm. releases enough enzymes into the cytoplasm of that cell to start an apoptotic or programmed cell death to occur. Mm. So, um, Interesting. this is one of the so reasons... The, the Cellular aging or cellular death does come about from you start to run low on the amount of mitochondria that should be in each cell and sure. you, you reach a point of no return and then cell gets shut down. Correct. That's exactly it. And Beautiful. so this is, this is quite normal except mm. for if you have a, a massive increase in oxidative stress or a massive demand for energy production... Um, mm. This, this appears to go at a much greater rate. Now, mm. we've spoken a bit about um, uh, intermittent fasting and uh, caloric intake. And as it turns out, intermittent fasting reduces the excess of energy that helps drive mitochondrial leakage. So mm. if you have too much energy being uh, created because you've got this massive influx of glucose going into the system and you're not doing enough neuromuscular work to actually burn it off, you have this buildup of concentration of free radicals that just punch holes in everything. And this is the suggested reason why people who are on a massively high carbohydrate caloric intake diet are actually at much greater risk of mitochondrial and therefore cellular aging and why the intermittent fasting is is shown to actually have a greater effect of decreasing aging in your system. Interesting. So that's um, high calorie diets. You're essentially driving the mitochondria to work super hard and then not burning off the energy that they're producing, which correct is causing the mitochondria to get holes punched in them and cellular death. Yep. Now, huh. in, in someone who you know maybe is a uh, Olympic distance triathlete or is a professional uh, MMA fighter who's training six eight hours a day, mm. they're probably going to be uh, burning off enough of the energy from their high calorie diet, and it, it probably is evening out. Mm. Okay, but then they have the you yeah, know see Michael Phelps in his ten thousand yeah. calorie day diet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And, and we're not seeing, and this is exactly what seems to be proving the concept, which is that if you're burning off enough, you can eat to some degree as much as you want. Mm. If you're the average uh, house couch potato who's kind of telling Michael Phelps how he should swim harder, you know, mm. watching the Olympics, etc., sitting there chowing down on a pack of crisps where you've got fat and salt and kind of carbohydrate, therefore glucose going in, you're mm. probably not going to do as well. Mm. This is going to build up a... a inappropriate level of uh, free radicals which punch holes in the membrane and as soon as you start punching holes in the membranes the protein structures that are embedded in them can't do their jobs properly and everything starts to go wrong from there yeah interesting so i mean uh, we have talked in the past about another um process that causes that sort of um cellular death faster than it should happen being that uh, and i say it wrong every single time i've been trying to say it during the week properly but i haven't uh glucosification glucosification <laughs> glucosylation or ah, glycation so yeah glycation glycation is much easier yep. for me to say yeah there where essentially excess um sugar in the blood starts to coat cells too much it, sure uh, and then your body thinks that because of the amount of, of sugar molecules in that cell membrane that that's an old cell and should die that, so that's absolutely the case. That process, doing like a high um, blood sugar diet plus the, the mitochondrial seepage, seems like a uh, two potent mechanisms to kill yourself off pretty quickly. That's exactly it. That's mm. absolutely the case. And so this is kind of working or, or further kind of illustrating the concept that uh, human beings have generally been in a boom-bust, high-energy output cycle, uh, meaning that 
you know, we would be walking a lot on a daily basis, climbing, pulling, fighting, you know, doing things, mm -hmm. and that we wouldn't necessarily always have large amounts of food. And so by having some food today and then not having some for three days, we were never allowing our uh, energy patterns to build up so much as to drive the... Mm. Um, apoptosis either from cellular leakage or from the glycation mm. so, so it's just the uh, period of plenty that we're living in that's that's highlighting this mechanism that's never been been uh well from an evolutionary point of view put to the now, test as you've heard me speak about also there is um cellular uh, epigenetic phenotypes that are G6PC2s and these people do really poorly on fasting diets because mm. their, their cortisol level goes up far too high as soon as their uh, blood sugar starts to drop. So they're what I kind of consider the exception to this particular statement and there's not really any specific research actually looking at the mitochondrial leakage versus this phenotype or that phenotype and it'd be really nice to see whether uh you know if you've got mm. a different um epigenetic structure whether it's going to affect you more or less um you know yeah, if there's any researchers smart. out there listening uh, i'd really like to know the answer to that so we can talk about it in the future yeah, uh there's phenotypes probably... and mitochondria well uh, and intermittent fasting mm. Mm. You know, everyone's kind of currently like, oh, yeah, it's the greatest thing. But I've got patients that can't do it to save themselves because of that G6PC2. Their personality devolves too much. But yeah, they get they get hangry. And yeah, then, that, and then, that's exactly yeah. it. Yeah. And then they get breakdown. <laughs> Damn it, I'm and eating something. This kind of continues with the mitochondrial leakage. Someone with concussion who's, uh, you know, basically stressed all the time tends to be hunting for a higher degree of carbohydrate in their diet because the carbohydrates release serotonin. Now, serotonin is a really interesting um, neurotransmitter at this moment in time because it affects some really important uh, neuronal pools in the upper part of the brainstem and the midbrain or mesencephalon. And one of the areas that it affects is the periaqueductal gray, both there and descending down the spinal cord. And that area helps uh, stop pain. And so if you don't have enough serotonin, you can't turn pain off. And these people will commonly be suffering with headaches and aches and pains all over the place. Further, the, uh, the neuronal pools that uh, stabilize eye movements, horizontal or otherwise, are also in that brainstem area and require serotonin. So if you've got unstable mm. eye movement, you're going to be taking your serotonin from your periaqueductal gray or from your personality spot, and you're going to be trying to feed it into your um, eye neuronal pools. Mm. Now, we know that serotonin gets released by eating carbohydrates and sugar. So if you're struggling to maintain personality, decrease pain, and keep your eyes on the horizon, what are you going to be hunting for? Mm. Get that sugar. Yeah. So as that sugar builds up and you physically can't do the, the output mm. to actually keep your system balancing out that equation, what you're going to do is induce more mitochondrial leakage, which Ooh, will that, cause apoptosis, which will cause a destruction in your energy field. And the low energy is shown to induce a sensation of brain fog. That's um, uh, Isn't that cool? <laughs> fascinating from the point of view of uh, SSRIs and depression. Oh, yeah. So yeah, if yeah. you've got you know, depression and you're driving your serotonin, so you, it's okay, let's feed that serotonin pool. And then, uh, yeah, anyway, that's, uh, mm. you don't have the um, motivation to get up and do something to burn yep. off that energy, further driving the, um, do, yeah. There's a, mm. a, a particular drug that they, uh, they tend to give um, for stopping noise, especially in these um, uh, concussion situations. So commonly, because of the brainstem distress and the vagal mm. nerve component of it, they give out, um, oh, what's the name S of it? Stemital or something? Stemital. There you go, Stemital. Um, hey, now, welcome, buddy. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Now, Stemital is a DRD2 um, inhibitor. So the stematil itself, uh, action appears to be on uh, the 
in inhibition of dopamine in the dopamine delta 2 pathway. Now, most people aren't going to know what that actually means, but the delta 2 pathway for dopamine is actually the inhibitory pathway. And so it allows go-no-go activity and the ability to train a Mm. new pathway out. So if you inhibit your ability to run that pathway, you cannot actually adapt your vestibular mechanism to a new stability. So taking Stematil is going to screw up your ability to stabilize yourself in the long term and get out of dodge. So for all those people out there, you've really got to kind of ask the GPs, et cetera, that you're working with, don't prescribe this. Uh, yeah. You know, I know no, these people's I'm, I'm, nausea. Yeah, trying to, trying to stabilize and rehab your vestibular system while you're on something that's actively working against it. That's got to Correct. be a good Correct, it's not yeah. going to work. Hey, let's spiral back or cycle <laughs> back to mitochondria. So mm. let's say that I am a fatty fat fat and uh, I mean I'm not if you've seen me I'm an amazing you, you're glorious <laughs> but uh, you're on your standard western diet I've got mitochondrial leakage and I've got the glycosylation yeah that's all right uh, um, it's a basically cellular death uh, now I'm, I'm saying this knowing full well that uh, you've got all of the toys at your disposal to fix this but as the average punter, how do I fix it, Scotty? How do I get my mitochondria healthier and stop this leakage? Oh, that's a, that's a really good point. So from a dietary perspective, uh, I would be looking at uh, altering towards more of what we look at as a classic Mediterranean diet. Mm. Now, a classic Mediterranean diet is quite whole food based. It's a lot more fresh. We're aiming for about 51% of your food as raw or fresh, preferably as green leafy vegetables, you know, aubergine, um, peppers, the collard greens, etc. You're basically trying to keep the sugars out completely. Alcohol is gone. Now, in all of these situations, I want to be really, really, really clear. There is no place for alcohol in in any whiplash, mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, or concussion situation. Although people are going to think, oh, but I feel a bit better, it is going to worsen every part of the problem. So mm. just, just putting that fire. out there. Yeah, absolutely. So other things that we need to be looking at is increasing uh, lipid membrane stabilizers. Now that includes your omega-3 fish oils, your phospholipids, so um, foods that are going to be high in choline, which is including eggs, um, things that have lecithin granules in it to try and get phospholipids in that way. Mm -hmm. And we're going to try and actually make new neuronal membranes at that particular point in time. Mm -hmm. We have to be uh, maintaining their metabolic output, so low levels of physical activity. And you basically Mm -hmm. are going to exercise them to the tolerance of their heart rate monitor. So as soon as you do, like, say you do three minutes of exercise and they're fine, they're fine, and they're, they're running at their, their normal average heart rate, and then they get to the fourth minute and suddenly it starts running away, well, great. You know that you're going to be exercising them for mm. three minutes at a time up until you start seeing, you know, uh, stability coming in in some of their other uh, neuronal outputs. Mm. Because the... As soon as you start pushing for energy and you need more, and you can see that with that autonomic shift, they're Mm. going to start punching holes in their mitochondrial membranes again and everything starts getting Mm. worse. So you've you've got to give enough physical exercise to keep something going, but Mm. not so much as to shift them into an autonomic dysfunctional Mm. state because that means cortisol and adrenaline comes in. Exercise to stimulate, not overload. Correct. And so, again, one of my favorite things for that is Alpha GPC, as we briefly spoke about earlier this week. Mm-hmm. Uh, enjoyed the golf clap. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I thought I found something that Scotty missed. Nope, he's already yeah, covered it. Well done. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, Alpha GPC is a really, really clever um, uh, nutrient. It's essential for making phospholipids, for one thing. Now, phospholipids mm. are... Um, cell signaling devices and membrane stabilizers. So they make up the outside lipid bilayer of every one of the cells, especially in um, neuro, uh, neurons and the, the axons and dendrites. So uh, there's very specialized ones and we're not gonna get into too much detail, but suffice to say is 
some of their really important properties is that they seal up membranes. And those membranes include both the gut lining as well as the blood-brain barrier, as well as making the, the outside neuronal membranes. And they go into making the inner and outer membranes in mm. the cells, including the mitochondrial envelopes. Mm. Essential for cellular repair. Yeah, ba basically. Now, what it also is shown to do is reduce the release of adrenaline in the system. Now, for oh. every molecule of adrenaline that gets released, and that was one of the other reasons why uh, we had you taking it originally, was because you were under a fair degree of load. Mm, running and, on adrenaline, yeah. Yeah, and you can't heal if you're running on adrenaline. This is going to help keep shunting you into a fight-flight scenario. So we've mm. always got to be pulling these people into a, a rest-digest phase. Now, acetylcholine is made from choline, which is in the glycerophosphocholine. So to make the neurotransmitter, you've got to provide sources of choline to help make mm, the mm. neurotransmitter. So it's one of the things that actually helps blunt that hyperactive fight-flight response and helps keep your memory operating effectively. Mm, good from a whole, whole bunch of angles. Absolutely Imagine. it is. And so mm -hmm. that was one of the, the things in your instance that I was looking at originally when we started putting mm. you on it. Uh, but it's essential in these uh, brain fog, hyper stress, mitochondrial leakage situations because it has mm. so many fingers into so many pies uh, to help the system actually improve itself. Yeah. Not the least improving testosterone if you've got uh, problems with your five alpha reductase. Yeah, I thought I found you on that one. But yeah. You know, too clever for me, Scotty. Oh, I wouldn't go that far, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, but then uh, um, to, to tie in, to, so, uh, yeah, we've got supplements, diet to help with the mitochondrial aging uh, process. Yep. Uh, let's talk about laser therapy, hyperbarics and cryotherapy. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so amazing that, tools for it. They are, absolutely. So in all of these instances, especially with uh, someone who's got mitochondrial leakage, energy loss, um, you know, concussion... All of these things, according to the literature, are shown to be improved by hyperbaric. Okay, mm. so low-level hyperbaric oxygen chambers at like 1.3 atmospheres are shown to help reduce neurological inflammation and oxidative stress. So, uh, you know, the the top researchers in the field uh, are pointing this out, and they're mm. using oxygen as a therapy using like different durations of time and again we can put someone in there and monitor their their uh, pulse oximetry it should be at um, you know uh, 99 100 while sitting in an oxygen chamber mm. and what we should also see is that uh, their heart rate stabilizes and goes down as they become more um, pressurized with mm. more oxygen and the repetitive use of it so time after time after time like 40 sessions 100 sessions etc is being used for people with severe neurological compromise um, similarly like uh, most of this work has come out of um, research from uh, deep sea divers who had uh, severe neurological dysfunction post getting the bends and, and mm. coming up and, and having problems with their their nitrogen in the bloodstream. And so they then kind of looked at different pressures and found that for most situations of neurological compromise and neurological inflammation that isn't caused by severe um, nitrogen compromise from deep sea diving, mm. 1.3 atmospheres is generally the best for that low level uh, neurological mm. compromise. But what most people don't understand with it is that it takes a long time. Okay, mm. so again, you're going to feel a bit better after one or two sessions. You know, oh, look, mm. I feel good. But it's the timely repetition, mm. week after week after week, building up for like 40 weeks, that is shown to increase uh, capillary bed vascularity in the brain and actually supply the tissue with more oxygen. And mm. that's one of the genetic effects that it's shown. So most of the effect of hyperbaric is actually done in an epigenetic genetic fashion mm. by triggering you to make uh, new uh, capillary pathways and increase protein release in the brain to actually stabilize the neurons themselves. Mm. So I was kind of surprised. I thought it was just the oxygen. But what it, it's shown is that that oxygen acts to stimulate the genes mm. to actually make new neuronal pathways. 
Yeah. Fascinating. Okay. Um, so that, that's one of my absolute favourites because uh, apart from, uh, you know, someone who's got, you know, sinusitis are full up and their, their ears won't kind of pressurise, depressurise, there's mm. no risk. You can't harm someone by giving them oxygen. Oxygen is essential for life. So mm. if you stick them in and they've, they've got ear problems, well, you know, don't. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> just yeah don't um but yeah or in in actual bar, truth bar to that, that. Yeah, you, like even then if they've got, um, you know, also the other one is a collapsed lung, they're not going to do very well at that particular moment in time. <laughs> if you've got pneumothorax, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah don't do that. So hospital. otherwise, oh, yeah. though, <laughs> you, you, oxygen, like compressed oxygen, you can get oxygen condensers. That might be another way of getting it into them and increasing their, their um oxygen levels and what it's shown to do is hyperbaric uh, is shown to help reduce uh, reperfusion injury in in some of these situations especially mm. post stroke post concussion etc mm. um, you by keeping the tissue saturated the cells keep uh, operating in a oxygen dependent fashion rather than an anoxic uh, mm. state and they don't have the drive for um, mitochondrial leakage and that's one of the big things that actually drives the mitochondrial leakage is when it's operating um, in a low oxygen environment mm. and not doing uh, oxidative respiration yep. so other, other things that i use obviously uh, i'm a great fan of laser and i've got both mm. class two and class four lasers and we've uh, absolutely found that light therapy is therapeutic and it's shown to reduce inflammation and in induce uh, blood supply and oxygenation to tissue. Uh, it's shown to stimulate neuronal pathway reconnections and neuronal growth. And again, it's shown to do this at a genetic epigenetic level, mm. apart from just driving oxygenated blood. Because again, if we think about mm. the um, thermo um, molecular effects, if you put specific frequencies of light into the bloodstream, a red light will stimulate the uh, red cells to actually speed up their spin, which increases their activity. And you can mm. actually drive more oxygenated blood to areas that you're mm. wanting. Now, can you do it specifically? Probably not. You know, I'm, I'm mm. not going to say, you put it there and you're absolutely going to see. No, we can't prove that at this moment in time. But what we mm. do know is that when you're doing it, it drives uh, mm. oxygenated blood to tissue. And this seems to be what helps drive the uh, cellular and functional changes uh, in people to heal much, much quicker. And again, from just physical injury, the research shows that you can chop a sprain down by at least a third to a half in its healing mm. time by utilizing uh, cold laser on it. Um, I think that's pretty cool. And my other favorite toy is, of course, my new cryotherapy uh, chamber. Boom. Going yeah, well? I, I love it. It's um, If not for the fact that I got scammed on the first one and, uh, yeah. the, <laughs> you yeah, know. A, uh, a saga in itself. Oh, it's still ongoing. Yesterday, we started applying uh, to um, with the courts for default judgment against the, the company and the individual that I'm suing. Uh, and, and can I say, uh, one of the, the people involved, the founder of the company, has uh, just lost his appeal against being a convicted rapist. So, not looking good, buddy. <laughs> it's not looking good for anyone in there. It's not looking good for me because that may mean that he's got zero money to pay me back for scamming me. But the new machine is absolutely better. Better. And um, again, cryo is shown to have a epigenetic effect. It's in a similar fashion to like fasting does mm. of driving down inflammation and increasing your sirtuin gene activation to actually stop mitochondrial leakage. Now, I can't sit here and pretend that I can tell you every one of the pathways that it's doing, but that's the uh, the research effect that seems to be coming out at this mm. moment in time. From the neurological but, support, that's the main one that we're interested that, in. That's yeah. absolutely the main one. Now, again, if you've got... Um, significant issues with blood pressure especially low blood pressure probably not the greatest tool i wouldn't necessarily use it in those people mm, so you'd want to get it. a bit more yeah okay uh, now you could do it at lower temperature so again my machine will go up to or down to minus 170 so mm. you could take them down to minus 70 and hold them there for a period of time and mm. and use kind of 
warm cold, so to speak. Yeah, you're still yeah. going to feel cold, no, you're but you're not going to put them under the, the same degree of stress. And then you can go to 75. And because my machine is, is really, uh, you can dial in in five degree temperature differences. And so I can hold it at 75 or 110 or, or whatever. Mm. Um, we really? can actually cold stress someone to actually create cold heat adaptation. Now, mm. it's absolutely going to drive the release of endorphins into the system. It's going to change vascular flow because you go from 25 degrees to, say, minus 100 and, um, you know, 25 degrees. So there's a 150 mm. degree differential and then back out again. You're going to have your blood supply go from your tissue to your core and back out again. And this mm. causes a, a sensation of euphoria. And, you know, after this machine, I had a patient go through. It was one of the very first ones with the new machine. And I adjusted her afterwards. And while she was sitting there telling me about what had been going on, she said, I feel high. <laughs> and she just had this, this kind of happy, surprised, quizzical look on her face. She said, not like coffee high. P- proper high. Like, yeah. <laughs> and just <laughs> was the most awesome thing. It, like, it stuck with me. Um, and so <laughs> shout out to Trish. Yeah. So if you're listening, this is you. You know it. Um, <laughs> it was so, really uh, cool. Mate, that's uh, – so in in, uh, in summary, because I've got to start trying to say I've got a patient coming in soon. Mm. Um, mitochondrial uh, leakage. Um, so that's going to be present in anyone with air like, – low energy levels, running on adrenaline, yeah. concussion, post-exercise yeah. soreness, chronic pain. Like, it's going to be a factor in any sort of problem it's that's a, promoting It's a factor. Cellular. Yeah. Full, full stop. Everyone gets mm. some degree of it. The issue is not that they get it. It's that they get more than they can contain and mm. deal with. And this is where the, the tissue mm. injury and the rupture, like from a, a head knock, becomes mm. a big issue because you've lost blood supply to the area. You're now operating in an anoxic state and you're going to get the, the increase in free radicals being created that you can't actually stop a appropriately, that's going to actually damage more of the membranes. And when more of them pass, like hit past that point of no return, it's all off for those cells. And so you get this cascade of damage. And so in a stroke situation or, or what's shown in concussive situations is there's the, the focal point of, of injury and impact and damage. And then there's like a halo around it. Mm. And that, that keeps expanding the more low oxygen the person becomes. So the more you stress the person, the more that halo expands and mm. you get more damage through mm. the tissue. As I say, that, that's absolutely critical in, in stroke and people uh, like the, the surgeons, the neurosurgeons, et cetera, say, you know, like seconds count in those moments. Again, mm. hyperbaric uh, is shown to actually make a real big impact on it because it, it stops that reperfusion injury. Because if you go too long without the oxygen because the clot wasn't taken out soon enough or you didn't get clot busters in then that cascade of damage just spreads and spreads and spreads so if you've Mm, squeezed mm. the oxygen into the tissue the Mm. the tissue stays operating at a um aerobic capacity and you just don't get the cascade of damage going in yeah brilliant so so mitochondrial laser therapy to promote mitochondrial health yeah absolutely Alpha GPC and and cryotherapy as the chair on the top is how you're going to slow down or or uh, um, as much as possible that mitochondrial aging dysfunction. Yep, absolutely. And then of course you are going to uh, once you've got their metabolic stability going, then you do your neurological rehabilitation and try and actually get those pathways to start to renew themselves so they can resume a full and functional life again. And there's never a moment that we don't want to give credit to, uh, you know, neurological rehabilitation, especially people like uh, the Carrick Centre who've bought us a whole bunch of this stuff and Mm. the people at FNOR. But again, I strongly point out that uh, lots of the practitioners out there doing rehab probably aren't looking effectively enough at the metabolic capacity of the patients that they're flirting with. Mm. And and they're actually driving dysfunction because the people do not have the blood supply, oxygen, or energy to actually mm. make these things stick. Yeah, that's a uh, excellent point. Uh, mitochondrial health is, is key. Absolutely. Mm. Mate, that's, right. um, 
That was that was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, and uh, next uh, next session, mate. What do you want to talk about? Ah, well, look. Teaser. <laughs> Give people a teaser. Well, let's talk about boobs. Right, uh, I know, I know you're very interested in, in boobs, and uh, you we'll, we'll say I have a long-term fascination. <laughs> yeah, that would be fair. Yeah, and maybe we'll talk about some bacteria in relationship to them and some of the interesting things that are occurring in microbiomes and fecal uh, transplants and obesity and some stuff like that. Beautiful. I love it. Boobs and obesity. Oh. It's a good topic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, mate. Uh, okay. Thanks for it. Thanks. Yeah, mate. Brilliant. Ciao for now. Have a good day. Thank you for watching. To learn more from Dr. Scott, visit our site at optihuman.com.au.